Before I start, I just wanted to ask, how many of you have seen this presentation before? One, two, three, four. Okay. Five. Okay. Um, there's two versions. One is longer than the other. The original version is longer by 30 slides. This is, this is the original version, 95 slides. So this will, yeah, and this was uh, in this year in Mayapur. There was a great meeting of all the leading devotees in ISKCON. And during that meeting, they were deciding what is the most important point that devotees need to understand about the practice of Krishna consciousness. <coughs> And uh, the conclusion was, from 95 senior devotees, devotees don't read Prabhupada's books. Not enough, but they do read. And so, Prabhupada's books are the foundation for the understanding of how Krishna consciousness works. It's also the knowledge of the nature of Sri Krishna, the spiritual world, how the material energy works, and uh, different aspects of material existence and spiritual practice. It gets into the physical, it gets into the psychological aspect, what is the nature of the mind, and how to use, how to use the mind in Krishna consciousness. It has wonderful pastimes of great devotees who practice Krishna consciousness and the struggles that they went through in order to achieve perfection. Prabhupada's books have a long, long list of so many aspects of knowledge, spiritual realization, practice that are necessary for us to become successful in the practice of Krishna consciousness. So this particular presentation it was developed by Lakshmi Moni. I'm sure you, you just had it. Ashwin Moni's Association in Guyana. Uh, and uh, when I saw it, immediately I asked her, I would like to present it also. And so she made it available for me. And uh, I chopped it up and took 30 slides out to make a shorter version because I thought it was too long. But I decided this weekend I present the long version. <laughs> so I hope you can stay with it. And the way this presentation works is I don't do anything, you do everything. So what does that mean? I, uh, I'll be moving the slides along and you'll be reading the slides. So I'll call on different devotees to read. Or if you want to read, you just raise your hand and then you can read. And that way you'll become more connected with what is being said. This presentation is very systematic. It's very uh, intelligently arranged. It is um, complete in helping us understand deeply what Prabhupada's books are about and how important it is that we read and study these books. So, some of you look quite bewildered. You heard me, oh my God, I have to read. I can't read English anyway, but that's okay. 
You can read it in any any language. It's the same message. Mm -hmm. I can start. Hmm? I can start. Okay. So I let's try. I'll just. Uh, how and why is it, more, is it more important to study Srila Prabhupada's books more deeply now, where now is than ever before? Okay, so next slide. So we're talking about generations of devotees. So there's four generations of devotees. And the first generation is Srila Prabhupada. He is the first generation. Second generation is his direct disciples, those who got initiated by him. Third generation is you guys, disciples of his disciples, and then you will also become gurus, and disciples of the disciples of his disciples. So we're talking about how many years is that? About a hundred years maybe? A generation is about 25 years, right? So we're talking about spanning a life span of about 100 years. Okay, next. Now, what are the different aspects of Prabhupada's books? So one of them is called Issues. So, Issues. Can someone read? Issues. Problems that may arise or significant decisions that need to be made. Okay, so we, 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 we face issues every day in our Krishna consciousness. We have the woman's guru issue. We have the Ritvik issue. We have the um, what else issue. There's so many how to understand the different complexities of practicing Krishna consciousness that are naturally arise through the process of bhakti, different issues that may arise. Should we, uh, you know, the issues of dress, the issues of, what else, what is another issue? The issues of prasadam, different kinds of issues. These are not direct philosophical points, but very important. Okay, that's one thing. Second one is? Instructions. The information given by our founder, Acharya, to resolve issues. Okay, so we have the issues and then the instructions to resolve the issues. Next. Context. The oh, relevant situations which inspired that instruction and which shaped the particular instruction. So the instruction is in influenced by the situation that inspired that and within the context that is being presented. So what may work for India may not work for the West. What may work for the West may not work for India. Like that. And what and what caused that instruction, just like Prabhupada sometimes said, now we need to um, bring in chanting of Lord Nishringadev's prayer. It wasn't done at the beginning. And why, what was the situation that brought it in? Someone attacked the devotees, and Prabhupada said, now we should learn to chant Nishringadev's mantras. <coughs> So the situation inspired the instructions, which shaped a particular you know, you know, issue, which would help an issue. Okay. okay, and the last one? Intention. The goal which Srila Prabhupada was trying to achieve in giving a particular instruction. He may gave the same instruction to different people, but then again, the goal that he was trying to achieve. Just like we might say, when he was asked, um, um, one time Papa was giving a lecture and someone said, Papa was talking about first class men, second class men, third class men, fourth class men. So one person challenged, saying, you think you're 
your, your first class. Prabhupada said, no, I am fifth class because I'm serving all the other four classes. And then another time he answered the same questions by saying, no, I'm first class because I have heard from a first class person. Therefore, I've, explained, I've practiced that instruction in the first class. So the answer may have been given differently according to the situation. The intention may not always be to give the answer, but to make a point that would carry on to the audience. Sometimes, just like if you have a, a discussion between a person, you know that you're not going to convince them of your opinion. But at the same time, there's a large audience listening. So you still discuss it with that person just for the benefit of the audience, knowing that that person's never going to change. Even if you defeat them by your own abilities and intelligence, still you might think, I can't defeat them, it doesn't really matter, but I'm going to make my points for the benefit of others. So. That's an example of intention that's not directly involved with the person you were talking to. So, some example. This is very interactive, so anytime you want to say something about anything that's being said, just speak up. So don't feel shy. You want, in fact, the more we participate in this, the more we can, what we say, get our intelligence connected with these issues. Okay, next one. Here's a few of the issues. Initiation, Shiksha Diksha, Varnashram, Preaching. Looks like us, right? Different Requirements for initiation, what is shiksha, what is diksha, how do we implement varnashram, how do we preach in Krishna consciousness, different ways of preaching. So these are just some examples of issues. Okay. Instructions, okay. As our spiritual leader and ultimate manager, Managerial. Managerial authority left us. What did he leave us? Books. Lectures. Conversations. Levels. Personal instructions. So Prabhupada gave us the philosophy and the practice in all of these in his books, in his lectures, in his conversations, in his letters, and personal instructions. Now, you might say, even the instruction may be the same, but in the context that is given, may be differently understood. So in the letters, they're more direct to an individual. When he spoke to someone, he said something. We probably made a lot of contradictions. There was a lot of, he said one thing and then he, later on he said something else. So conversations with others, his general lectures and his books. Okay. So. Content. What, who, what is it, who is it about? What is it about? Where does it take place? What does it take place? What do we have here? Is that the same thing? <coughs> is it? It is and it isn't. <laughs> so time changes the medium and also changes how we see the medium also. Content. So, what is the time the, inst the instruction was given? What is the place? What is the circumstances? Just like Prabhupada said, 
when someone was, he asked someone to go preach in Russia and during the communist era. And at that time, there was hardly any food available. So the devotee said, well, Prabhupada, there's nothing to eat there except meat. And Prabhupada said, eat meat but preach. So we know we're not supposed to eat meat. Well, what is the situation that inspired that? That preaching is more important. Therefore, with that in mind, one can adjust things for a higher principle. One can adjust things for a higher principle. The higher principle is preaching. But Prabhupada said, don't take advantage of that. Don't adjust for the sake of adjustment. Guess in other words, I adjust because I don't like the way it is now. No. It has to have it has to be an emergency situation and it has to be somewhat authorized by the authorities. So, but we can do that. So time, place, and circumstance. You don't really preach to people in India the same way you preach to people in America or in Slovenia or Croatia. You might use a little bit of understanding of what is the Consciousness of the people, collective consciousness, what is the place, what's the circumstance? Okay? Yes, okay. Any questions? Yeah. Intention. What is the intention behind what is being said? Why is it being said? What was the mood? What was the why? What was the will means in this case? Basically, it means the intention. A certain intention. What is the mood? Why? And of course, the desired purpose. What is the goal of the instruction? Or what is the goal of that statement? So you see what's being presented. Now, it's not so easy to understand Prabhupada's books. But there's a way to approach them that helps us to understand easier. Okay. So we have, we have four generations. So we did, we did this before. We had issues, instructions, content, and intention, right? Okay, so, so the first generation, Prabhupada, Everything's clear. The issues are clear, the instructions are clear, the content is clear, the intention is clear. As we move into the next generation, um, the issues are clear, the instructions become a little bit less clear, therefore they need more explaining. The context by which the instructions were given also becomes a little less blurred, and then the intention is practically lost, and therefore that needs to be revived by persons who were there during the time that this was, was spoken by Prabhupada. What did Prabhupada mean in that statement? That is the intention. So the second generation loses the intention a little bit. The third generation, you guys, you know the issues. The instructions still have to be revived. They lost a little bit. The way the instructions were given, what context, gets lost and the intention is actually lost and lost. So as, as time goes on, we see Prabhupada's instructions and the, the, the aspects of those instructions, the context, the inten intentions, or how the instructions are understood, gets lost in the form of time. So, the second generation is meant to give what they learned from Prabhupada to this generation. And then this generation can give it to this generation, and that way nothing is lost. So each generation of devotees are responsible to enlighten and instruct the next generation in what Prabhupada had in terms of issues, instructions, contents, and intentions. 
Any questions about that? Yes, uh, say the point. Um, because it's a something that is something that when the person, Prabhupada in this case, speaks it, or, yeah, he speaks of it, there's a certain, uh, he has a certain intention that he's starting, he's trying to do. In other words, when I gave that example about a person says, you think you're first class. Prabhupada said, no, I think I'm fifth class. I'm servant of the first class. What was intention? What was he, why did he say that as opposed to saying when he said it in a different context, when he answered it differently in a different situation? What was his intention? So you can guess, well, Prabhupada's just being humble. Maybe. Or maybe Prabhupada wants to instruct the audience that we should see ourselves as servant of all the other devotees. So that's another, what was his intention? So in the same way when he writes certain things that we don't understand, we need to find those persons, just like now we're struggling with certain statements in Prabhupada's books, that are somewhat explosive and we're the, the GBC and others are trying to figure out what Prabhupada really is trying to say. Although the words are clear and one can somehow or other using intelligence try to understand it, but um, because of the, because it's somewhat contrary to what is usually said in that context, we have to understand well, what Prabhupada meant. You know, just like <clears throat> Prabhupada, sometimes people say Prabhupada didn't like women, but that's not true. But he said certain things about women that people in the material world became a very much puzzled, confused, and sometimes even uh, offended by it. So not knowing what the intention was, they guess. So, therefore, the intention needs to be kept clear by by it's hard in some ways because Prabhupada's not personally here. Okay. So, the intention is the one that gets the lost the easiest. Sometimes you'll ask, you, maybe you ask, uh, just like, I'll give you, let me just use you as an example. Can I do that? Okay, so you have a husband, right? So you might tell him something, not so much because he needs to hear that, but because you might tell him to do something because he's not doing anything. Just to get him to do something, you might tell him to do something. Not so much, it's not important that the what you're telling him to do as opposed to get him to do something because he's not doing anything. And it's becoming, and you're uh, you're kind of like unhappy because he's lazy. So it's not so much about getting him to do what you want him to do, but get him to do something. And you choose something to say. So no one can understand your intention except you. Maybe even the person who receives it. So a lot of times you find philosophy and instructions, the intention is really hard to figure out. Unless you really ask the person. For example, there's another one with Prabhupada. When Prabhupada was, um, when he took sannyas, there's a picture of Srila Prabhupada, he's very grave. He's like, he's very grave, extremely grave. And uh, so one devotee, it happened a couple of times when he saw the picture, 
one devotee said to another devotee, oh, your spiritual master, he looks very unhappy. And that devotee who heard, he said, yes, he's unhappy because people in this material world are suffering. So when that same devotee went to Prabhupada and said, Prabhupada, this is what this devotee asked about this picture. And Prabhupada said, let me see the picture. And Prabhupada said, oh, that was one of my happiest moments. <laughs> <laughs> so both of the devotees were wrong. <laughs> the one who saw it, the one who explained it. Until it finally got to the source, and then the source explains it. I mean, Mr. Donald Trump is a person, maybe, what is his, <laughs> what's his intentions for the way he does things? I guess you have to ask Donald himself. <laughs> He's a mystery for many. So, in that way, the intention really goes back to the person who makes the statement or writes the statement. And therefore, in the second generation, because Prabhupada is not here, the, t the intention many times gets lost. Not all the times, but sometimes. No? We don't always know what Prabhupada, why he said what he did, or said he wrote what he said. But if it is hard to, it's the most hard intention, like it's inner, yeah. inner life of every one of us. So if it is hard to uh, um, detect or, or say, tell, how can you say, you know, it's gone? <laughs> well, we try to bring it back. Each one of these things we try to bring back by, okay, we know Prabhupada, we heard of him, we heard him. We know pretty much what he's like and what he does and says. So based on our own experience of the person, we try to understand the attention behind the statement. So there's a guess, there's some guessing or some discussion based on that. What does he mean? Just like when you study the scriptures of people who are already led, what does this statement mean? So, using intelligence, using history, using reference, and maybe even using people who know the person, you try to revive the intention. But it doesn't mean the intention is not going to be able to be revived. It means it's generally, generally lost due to the fact that the person who has made the statement is no longer there. I wrote it. You know, just like many commentaries on about Krishna's pastimes. And the theme, Vishwanath Chakravarti Dakur, differs then from Jiva Goswami in many times. But to say one is right and one is wrong it becomes an offense. So based on their own realization, they get, a, they get an understanding of what, how this is to be explained for everyone. Does everybody, when you sing bhajan, does everybody understand why you sing? You sing to glorify Krishna, you sing to inspire the devotees. Or you sing because nobody else nobody else is singing. And you might sing for different reasons. You the person is the person who knows exactly why they do what they're doing. That's why people misunderstand each other so much because we always guess from our own limited understanding of what a person is about and what do they, why they do what they do. And therefore, people commit so many mistakes and sometimes even offenses until we get to know the person and get to talk to them. 
Yes. I think that our uh, guru in, in, in your generation uh, has so much of his uh, job for do surgery. It is impossible to have uh, intention, proper intention. You understand? Oh, proper intention can be there. Yes. But for us to understand it, that's hard. That's hard. Yes. Hmm. A man sees a girl and he thinks, oh, boy, I really want to have fun with this girl. So I'll give her a present. So the girl comes and she gets a present and she feels, oh, this person's giving me a nice present. But she doesn't know what is on his mind. <laughs> He's a rascal. <laughs> so, the intention is known by the person. Some issues that Srila Prabhupada made conclusive statements in, okay? So we need a reader, okay? Oops. Marriage, divorce. Prabhupada made statements about marriage and divorces, okay? Be careful in that. Okay. He made conclusive statements. Relationship, relationship between GBC and the temple. Temple presidents. The word is presidents. Yeah. What is the relationship between GBC? So these things Prabhupada spoke about a lot. And he answered questions on these things. And he could clarify it and make conclusive statements. When people said, well, you know, maybe, you know, in India, women were not given diksha. And that was the tradition. They simply get married to someone who was initiated. And they serve that person. And then they get the share of that person's spiritual advancement. That's how it was in Vedic times. But now Prabhupada changed that all around. And when it came to the West, he allowed women to do puja. He allowed women to, do, to get initiated. He allowed women to give classes, he allowed women to lead bhajans. He gave women in the West a lot more different, not different, but a lot more facilities to practice Krishna consciousness that wasn't there in Vedic India. And now it was Prabhupada wrong, no, because he understood the culture and he understood his mission in bringing Krishna consciousness to the West, he saw that women were a very vital part in spreading Krishna consciousness. And they should not be minimized or, or marginalized. What he said about marriages and divorces, what did he say? Prabhupada's conclusive statement. No divorce. Huh? No divorce. No divorce. He didn't say maybe. He said, he said, because Krishna consciousness is the solution to all problems, if there is some problem within the marriage, then that can be solved with the Krishna consciousness. Not by the Okay. Anything? Any other comments? Okay. Second generation, that's us, hearing from Srila Prabhupada's direct disciple. Okay, that's you guys. Intention, missing or fading, that's the first one. Intention of our founder is not directly present and must be reconstructed by knowing the instructions and finding the context in which it was given. This is a little bit about what? And Seva Kuz, this is what a little bit about the answer to your question. Okay. 
If things are unclear, what happens? Arguments. Do we have arguments nowadays? Sure. So many. Sometimes a different understanding gets stifled and confused. So these are the different things that can happen with you when the intention is, mi is missing or faded. It has to be reconstructed, it becomes unclear, different understandings are confused and stifled. Hmm. Okay, third generation. Okay, someone read? Shilapadas disciples done. Now we are hearing from disciples of Shiva Prabhupada's direct disciples. That's you guys. Missing and context and intention. The context is also missing. This must be reconstructed by memories from those who associate with direct disciples. Right. This must be reconstructed by memories from those who were associated with those direct disciples. Okay, next generation. All association with those who directly associate with Srila Prabhupada is now gone. Missing direct instructions, context and intention. This now needs to be reconstructed by a relevant system of education and careful study of those instructions that Prabhupada comments. All the devotees contact with the Krishna consciousness movements must read all the books that have been translated. The Chaitanya Charitamrita, Srimad Bhagavatam, Bhagavad Gita and others. Otherwise, after some time, they will simply eat, sleep and fall down from their position. Thus, they will m miss the opportunity to attain an eternal, blissful life of transcendental pleasure. From Chaitanya Charitamrita, Bhagya Lila, chapter 25, verse number 278. So what is Prabhupada saying? That uh, it's important to read my books, otherwise we will become uh, more, we will stay on the bodily platform and we'll simply find pleasure in eating, sleeping, rather than pleasure in reading and discussing Prabhupada's book. As, as spiritual beings, who have a material body, the intelligence needs to be activated. So if we don't use our intelligence for hearing the knowledge, discussing the knowledge, learning how to apply the knowledge, and becoming happy through that process, then Prabhupada says, what happens? We will look for pleasure in other things, like eating and sleeping and just wasting time. Any comments on that? Makes sense? Mm -hmm. Everybody agree? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, I find that myself. If I, if, I, if I go for a long time without reading Prabhupada's book, I find myself more interested in prasadam. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and when I'm not, when I'm reading more, I'm just thinking, I got no time. <laughs> I just, I want to read more, I want to discuss it more, I want to just, you know, it becomes a, a feature of, of a, a happiness. It's a fulfillment. Not only does it give us knowledge, but it inspires the soul in its relationship to Krishna. Okay. Someone read? You must all study where it's all of the books so that when the need arises, you can repeat in your own words their preferred. As much as possible, read, chant, and preach. This is our life and soul. If we keep to this simple formula, then there is 
no doubt that we will be the victorious wherever we go. Very <coughs> soon we will be the the only religion in the world. <coughs> She will pass that letter to Vridayananda Goswami, 6 January 1972. So he said, read as much as preach, this is our life and soul, study these books scrutinizing. Soon we will become the only religion in the world because we have this solid philosophical knowledge. Okay? Feel, feel free to comment on anything. Another letter. So now Prabhupada tells how success is there, and then he says, I guarantee you, you can rest assured that everything will come out successfully. If you read, try to understand from different angles of vision. If you don't have time to read, listen to tapes, and then hear, change your rounds, rise early, attend the Mongol art. So you might say, well, I live at home. How do I do that? Well, we can... Some of us have deities at home, and we can have a little mongolarchy in our home. And some of us say, well, I don't have time because I have to go to work. And then you have to arrange your schedule where you chant some rounds before you go to work and then have a schedule for the rest. In other words, you have to organize your day, but you don't neglect these things. Like, what do I do? I travel a lot. What do I do for mongolarchy? I hardly attend Mangalarti, but every day I listen to Prabhupada's chanting of the Mangalarti prayers. So we have iPads, so many different electronic devices. You find Prabhupada chanting Guru Bhastaka prayers. You find someone chanting Tulsi prayers. You find someone chanting Guru, the Guru Vandana prayers. And you, hear, you can also hear, you know, Bhagavatam lectures. So everything is there recorded, even if you can't go to the temple or it's not practical because of your, the way your life is arranged, you just do it through the media. And it's better if we can do it in practice, but if we can't, but somehow we shouldn't neglect these things. And then when we get a chance, we go to the temple and we take part in the Mongol art and it's so nice. So nice. So, and we, we forget when we don't do it. We forget how nice it is and how uplifting it is. So, therefore, we have to be reminded by doing it at least through the media. It's important. Anything? Any comments on this? Yes, it's a bit true. Wait, wait, she finishes, then you can do it. Well, sadhana, hearing and chanting the glories of the Lord, is the basis. Preaching is an extension of our sadhana. If you try to grow a tree without growing, giving water to the roots or nourishing the roots, you will, your fruit will never be so good. 
So you could have programs, but what is the quality of those programs is based on how much you're hearing and chanting and associating with the movies. Something can go on for a while, but not in the long run. After some time, we lose our enthusiasm for it. So, our success in Krishna consciousness, in anything we do, is based on chanting the holy names and hearing the philosophy of Krishna consciousness. That's why Srila Rupa Goswami says, every day you must hear Bhagavatam. Whether you go to the temple or hear it, whether you read it from the book, or whether you hear it from a recorded lecture, every day you must hear Bhagavatam. What we give back is what we have, and how what we have is what we take from hearing and chanting. That's our strength. The Prabhupada said, what is he saying here? Read, chant, worship. That's all he's saying. So if you do these things, everything will be successful. It may be hard for us because we live outside and we have other things to do, but we have to make time for these things. And then puts quality in what we do. We may not have a lot of time, but should, everything should be done with quality. Okay. Another letter. So Prabhupada is saying, you may not understand it, read it again. I'll give you an example. How many of you read Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati's uh, book with the purports and Brahma Samhita? Can you understand it? So what happened was, when that book came out, the devotees were reading it, and they couldn't understand it. So they said to Prabhupada, Prabhupada, why don't you write your explanation on your Guru Maharaj's statements so we can understand it. Prabhupada said, you just read it over and over, you'll get it. Read it once, read it twice, read it thrice, read it four times. If you read it over and over, it becomes clearer and clearer as you read it and think about what you're reading. Your intelligence starts to focus and things. And of course, if you may not understand all of it, but each time you read, you get something more. It's just the nature. Okay. Okay. There's a verse. is revealed, becomes revealed. This is a fundamental principle that if you have, what is this word, who knows what this word means? Unflinching. Janaki now, tell us what unflinching means. Is that your faith is in way or change? Fixed. Cemented. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that, yeah. So that means in all situations. What can waver our faith is different situations. I have faith in this when I'm in this situation, or when this situation comes, I might be challenged. So one who is never, who is completely cemented 
in all of the all situations, that's unflinching faith. And what is that faith in? Free Lord and spiritual master. And then, because of that faith, even though you don't have much knowledge of Vedic philosophy or life, anything, if you have that faith, then that is the foundation for re realizing the knowledge. That knowledge becomes re revealed to you through the heart, through the mind. That's the power of full faith. We have to work on developing full faith. How, do we, how, we, how, do, how does faith develop? Chanting helps to strengthen your faith, yes. More and more, yeah. Associate with those who have faith. Yes, that's important. To associate from and hear with, hear from those who have faith, both, yes. Huh? By following the instructions, you get the results, and when you get the results, your faith becomes stronger. Yes. Serving who have faith. Hmm? Serving who have faith. Serving those who have that faith. Yeah. You have personal experience with that. Personal experience is the best form of teaching. To spread knowledge to other person. Yeah. And when you give the knowledge to others, your faith also increases. Because, why? Because you also have to follow what you speak. You say something to others to, for some knowledge or some instructions. You're also challenged to see how much you're following what, you, what you're speaking. Okay, this is a very important verse. It's from the Sweta Svatara Upanishads 6.8. Um, I wish we could go a little bit. The screen is a little bit short. Reminds me of a mini skirt. We need a full skirted lady here, not a mini skirt. Does anybody have a longer sheet we can put up there? Yeah. Okay, if someone is speaking to you, this is a very good point, a very good point. That if you don't have faith or respect for the person, you cannot receive what they're trying to give you. You cannot fully receive it because of that. The medium of assimilation or acceptance is based on your faith in the person. Okay, three types of, no, then we're going to talk about studying Paramahansa books. Three types of study. First type is? What is that? What does that image portray? Contemplation. He's contemplating about what he's reading. He's not just reading; he's thinking about it. That's called prayerful reading. Not just reading the words and going. That's nice. But thinking about it, contemplating it, and maybe even in the mood of prayer. Okay. I have a question. Uh, is it like prayerful uh, reading, uh, like a really slow reading? 
slow or fast is relative to the person. But generally it's more, what's the word? It requires a mindset. Just like when you're driving a car, you could be driving the car and you could be watching the scenery around you and also waving at the cows as you go. But if you're not really fully connected with the driving because maybe you could, you'll hit a bump because you're not paying attention. So when you absorb yourself in the driving, then your driving is, becomes expert. Becomes expert. So, what is available in the form of knowledge becomes more and more revealed by a concentrated effort to understand. You're reading, you're thinking, you're contemplating, you're even maybe getting some realization of what is being read. Well, what, what does this image say to you? Absorption. More like a relax. He says relax, he says absorption, okay. He's very grave when he reads. He's great. He reads with respect and enjoying what he reads. I think you're all right. It has a certain reflect. I think, it, I think he shows that he's really eager to learn. He has a certain eagerness about him. And he's sitting up very straight, which indicates also a sense of uh, absorption. He, re he read uh, near water. This is very... This, uh, this is water? Yeah, it's the ocean. Yes, this is very uh, over. Okay. okay. It's, yeah, it's more relaxing. Okay. Here we go. So there is nothing to be said new. Whatever I have to speak, I have spoken in my books. Now you try to understand it and continue your I shall never die. I shall live forever in my hopes. May 7th, 7th. This Bhagavata Purana is as brilliant as the sun, and it has, it has arisen just after the departure of Lord Krishna to his own abode, accompanied by religion, knowledge, etc. Persons who have lost their religion due to the dense darkness of ignorance in the age of so here, okay, this is a statement from the Bhagavatam, 1, 2, 43. So Prabhupada is saying that there's nothing new. I have, what, I've, what I want to give you, I've said it in my books. Now you under, try, try to understand it and work accordingly. I am always with you. My books are non different than me. So you can associate with Prabhupada through his books. Just like that statement there. What is Bhagavatam? Bhagavatam is Krishna. What is Prabhupada's books? Prabhupada's books is Prabhupada. Mm -hmm. Non different, apparently, but different also. Apparently different, but uh, 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 actually not different. Okay. Okay. How many of you received this on the conference? I sent this out. These are the ten steps on how to read from other approach Prabhupada's books. Okay, we all ready for this one? We'll go through these a little quickly. Yes. 
And try to remember, and one word is left out. Try to remember, recall any realizations that have been offered to you. Assimilate into your life what you have read and realized. Read Srila Prabhupada's books in this fashion as much as you can. Any questions about those 10 steps? Should we go back? Yes. Okay, decide on what you're going to read, that's clear. Decide how long you will read, that way you don't, you think, oh, I'll read till I get tired. Mm. It's good, mm. but you may not do that every day. Pick it, you know, and choose, all right, I'll read for an hour. Okay, next. Go to a place where you can be uninterrupted. In other words, turn off the phone, go away from the kids, go away from the, you know, in other words, you, you, wanna, you don't want to be interrupted because you want to get absorbed in the movement. Okay, the next one. Uh, if you get too comfortable, you might fall asleep, but get comfortable where you can be. Focused. Okay. Cultivate an appropriate attitude. What is an appropriate attitude? With love and faith. Faith? I don't know how much love we have, but if we, if we have love, that's nice too. I love to read. We desire to understand. Huh? We desire to understand. We desire to understand what we read. That's a, that's good. Called, that's a proper attitude. Another one. With respect. Ah, that's good. With respect. Who said that? Oh, okay. Yeah. This is you're actually approaching Krishna. So, in a respectful mood. Okay. Now there are prayers by Sanatan Goswami on the Bhagavatam, so you may also read those prayers. I read those every day now. Ever since I came across this, every time I read Bhagavatam, I recite those prayers. There's four prayers, and it only takes about the most five minutes to read. So that helps you, that puts you in a good consciousness. How many of you like to read aloud? The other day, I always like to read silently. But something happened the other day, I was reading silently and I couldn't stay focused. And then I started reading loud and then I became completely focused. <laughs> so you feel the most important thing is to, what's comfortable for you? Where you can assimilate what you're reading, okay? Read a word, a phrase, or an idea. When it strikes you, try to understand it more. And don't just keep reading and say, I got an hour to read, I'm gonna get as much done as I can. The idea is to somehow or other get something that you can take away with you and remember it. Something outstanding.
help your obeisances and try to remember what was, what was these are that was number nine. Practice some of the knowledge that you have gotten. Prabhupada said this, I'm gonna to try to do it and I'm gonna to try to do my service with this consciousness in mind. I'm gonna do my service by applying this fashion. So now you're actually experiencing the knowledge and now it becomes realized. These are the these are the prayers by Sanatana Goswami. I recite these every day. Yes. This is the translation for the first prayer. Anybody you want to, oops, I'm sorry. Someone want to read that? of Bhagavatam. Not different than Krishna. It gives spiritual vision. It's rich with jewels of philosophical conclusion. It's the best part of the Vedas. It comes from the ocean of nectar. It is, it's Krishna. Bhagavatam. Second one. This next one is the one I like this next one. Oh Srimad Bhagavatam, oh my only friends, oh my companion, oh my teacher, oh my great, great wealth, oh my believer, oh my good fortune, oh my beast, I open respectful obeisance to you. Friend, companion, teacher, wealth, deliverer, good fortune, good. Nothing goes wrong. Mareka Bando, Matsagin, Matkuru, Mang Mahatana, Mandestara, Mat Bakya, Man Ananda, and else today. Beautiful verse. Mm -hmm. Okay. Here's one. This is the last one of the four. You like that one? I mean, I asked, I'm, I'm studying, I'm doing Bhagavatam now, and I'm going through the whole Bhagavatam. And I'm writing like one or two line statements on every verse in purport. And so, I'm, I write, when I do it, I write by hand, because I can't type. I'm lousy at typing. And so when I'm done, I look at it and I say, hmm, who, can, who can transcribe this into something readable? <laughs> so I put it out on the conference and Ramanandini you know, said, I'll do it. So I just finished the fifth canto. I did fourth canto, third canto. I have to go back over and do first and second canto. And I've done parts of the sixth canto and seventh canto and, and tenth canto also. But I to eventually I want to finish the whole Bhagavatam with one or two line statements on every verse, and that way people 
can read these and get an idea of what is about that verse or purport and then go right to it if they find that of an interest. It's very interesting if they read it already and they read this again, they will be, oh yes, I have forgotten about it now and now we forget. Yeah. Do you make me remember? Yeah. And I try to pick out the main points or maybe something that really is outstanding. Something that is the, the essence of what's being said. Of course, if somebody else did the same thing I was doing, they may come up with different things. This is pretty much what. So if any of you want some typing work, we got more. <laughs> Just let me know. Okay. Reading with the bodies and getting the most out of what you read. Someone read? This is what you can get from the reading. Explain it, discuss it, ask questions, different angles of vision. This, 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 this one is interesting, different angles of vision. Mm -hmm. Bhagavatam is so full of knowledge that one person may read something and explain it in one way and another person may explain the same thing in a different way. And both are right. So it's full. And of course, whatever you learn, apply it. And that is called, what is that called in Sanskrit? Which one? The last one. Nidhyasana. Yeah, okay. It's also Vigyan. Nidhyasana Vigyan. Okay, next one. What to look for when you read? Who are these personalities? Okay. They're the backbone of our knowledge. Everything we have is coming from them. Okay. What's theoretical knowledge? Understanding? Application? Realization? Higher thinking, skills, and values. So how knowledge progresses to these different areas. You read, you understand, you apply, you get realizations. And then through those realizations, you develop skills and values. <coughs> you can see how Bhagavatam is progressing. Any questions on this? Application is before realization. Sometimes we need maybe realization before uh, reach. If if that is what is meant. Well, application. if you already realized it, that means you have no problem applying it. <coughs> but generally, application brings realization. It's knowledge in action. It's called. There's gyan and vigyan. Vigyan means vishishti gyan. Vishishti gyan means that knowledge which is practiced. And through that practice, one understands the knowledge as it goes beyond the theory. Now, realization comes from application. If you have realization before application, it's quite rare. That means you're a great soul. <laughs> and somehow, simply by reading the books, you realize the books. But before you, before you can actually realize it, 
before you can actually come to the stage of realizing the knowledge by reading, you must have had some experience previously. Because it just doesn't happen. Realization comes by a combination of uh, application and understanding. It's pretty hard. I thought application is like preaching. No, that's for you. Preaching is more or less... Well, when you understand it and you preach it, and you get realization is also. Yeah. The application could be preaching. Yes. Individual. Yeah. That's one way of applying it through preaching. Yeah. Okay. So we're going through these now. Is anybody ready for this one? Knowledge. The, theory, the theoretical knowledge facts which form the foundation of ongoing progress in Krishna consciousness. So we're reading and we're getting some <coughs> facts, knowledge. The process is that you should memorize the portraits of my books and then speak them in your own words. Do not adulterate or change anything. Then you will be the perfect preacher. So here, what's, what's being said? You should memorize the words. Memorize, but then, even after you memorize, then what is Prabhupada says? You can memorize something and repeat it exactly how you memorize it. And that's okay. But when you speak it into your own room, words, you actually add a certain level of realization to it. He says, in other words, in speaking it to your own words, he says, what does he say? So this is preaching. You'll see many times when someone is preaching, they explain the same knowledge in their own words. It's like even if you read a verse from Bhagavad Gita, you can explain, you can speak the verse by explaining the essence of what is being said, as opposed to just repeating the, the actual words. It's like sometimes I asked one senior devotee about, you know, like, like some of the translations have been changed in Bhagavad Gita after the first editions. He says, yes, but, and I said, well, I like the old translations. And he says, that's fine. Whether you use the old ones or the new ones, the essence is the same. The essence is the same. But the new ones seem to want to bring out certain elements that may not be so clear in the first translation. That's why it was done. But in any case, there's no new knowledge being put into that verse. It's just the same, same verse explained in different words, with the same words. Different words, that's all. Did you find a yes? Such a matter? Experience shows that you've got some realization. Yeah. yeah. And that has much more effect. When I, that, I mean, that is some effect. My experience. 
No, that's actually Krishna consciousness. There's nothing new in this in the philosophy of, of of spirituality, but how it's presented according to realization appears to bring something new. But it's just a different realization step. That's why Prabhupada didn't end the per, the parampara. He's, he established a certain foundational principle based on his knowledge and practice. And now he says, take it and take it further. By your own practice, by your own understanding, your own realization, explain it in your own words. That's Krishna consciousness. And the acharyas do that too. Sometimes people get, it happens in all religious systems, people get, what we say, what's the word? They become dogmatic. And they just, they don't have the realization of the knowledge, but they can repeat the verses. So the acharyas will take that same verse and explain it and, and speak it in a different way. People say, oh, something new. But it's not. It's like they used to say, old wine and new bottles. And that's what we want. We want people to be able to have to do that. That's, that's good. Nice point. That was a good point. Okay. Now, understanding. Deepen your understanding of the Krishna consciousness theology, particularly through studying it from a wide range of perspectives and through developing thoughtfulness and introspection. Mm -hmm. Through, particularly through studying it from a wide range of perspectives. What the different acharyas say on this particular verse, this particular point, this particular subject matter. And then through thoughtfulness and introspective, you can you come to a certain understanding yourself. Is that clear? Any comments on that? Depending yeah. on different situations, no? It depends on time, place, and circumstance, yeah. yeah. <coughs> to hear and explain them, the books, is more important than reading them. One can assimilate the knowledge of the revealed scriptures only by hearing and explaining. Hearing is called Shrava. And explaining is called kirtana. The two processes of shavana and kirtana are of primary importance to progressive spiritual life. So, what is the result of shavana and kirtana together? I'll take it one step further. What comes next? Wonder. Huh? Remember. 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 Smart. So, if you hear something, that's nice. When you speak it, you start developing realizations of it, and that brings about memory. So memory comes from hearing and chanting. So one can assimilate the knowledge through the process of shravana and kirtan. That's why it says it's more important to explain than, than just reading the books. To, to Hear, oh, I'm sorry, go back. To hear and explain is more important than, than just reading because it leads to smart. But, so, yes. Uh, what is the difference here between hearing and reading? Um, well, when you're hearing, there's an advantage. And that is, you're getting direct knowledge from a person who's speaking it, and therefore the person's and it becomes personal in the sense that they're communicating their own realizations of that knowledge to you. And not only do you get the knowledge, but you get their understanding along with that knowledge. Prabhupada says this, and someone else says the same thing. 
And so there's an individual difference between the quality of that, what we say, sound vibration because of the purity. Now, if you're reading it, it also has that same element, but the thing about reading, the advantage of reading is that you can take your time and go back and reflect. When you're hearing, just like we're hearing now, we're going from one subject to another. We may not dwell on one subject too long, but when here, when you're reading, you can, on your own, you, you find a point of interest, you read it, you reflect on it, you get, get into a proper attitude to understand more. That's the advantage of, he, of reading. We're hearing is the process of Krishna consciousness, because the whole basis of knowledge that is coming down from our tradition is based on Guru speaking to disciples. So both have an advantage, but Prabhupada said that hearing directly from the spiritual master is <coughs> is the most effective form of transmission of, tra of transcendental knowledge. And when you're hearing, you know, you can also ask questions. It's hard to ask questions to the book. <laughs> you can, but you'd have to come up with your own answers. <laughs> Both are direct, but both have a certain element in it that's different than the other one. I know Prabhupada would say, sit down and hear, that's most important. When you can't hear directly, then you can read. That is also hearing, but it's less direct. This is like if you... This is not a good example. I mean, I don't like reading on a computer, but I like reading the same thing in, the, in a book. I feel the book is more personal, talks to me more directly. I feel more like I'm getting something. I'm on the computer. The medium of, is the message. So that electronic message seems to obscure a little bit of the quality of the message just the way the message is presented through the electronics. There's a book when I was growing up, it was called The Medium is the Message. It was a bestseller. The Medium is the Message. And although the same message may be given, if it's given in different mediums, it has a different effect upon the hearing. Sachi Mati, you had your hand up before. Yes, I was trying to understand that point to hear and explain is more important than reading, but I think. Okay. Mm -hmm. Is that clear, Tulsi? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Maybe just one short question, just occasion. Um, can we consider that hearing from a spiritual master is even beneficial to us because we also get the correction. Because when you're sitting in front of the book, you can actually sometimes understand things on your own way, you know, how you think it should be. Yeah, that's, but, that's generally true. But when you're, when you're in front of the person, it is very, I mean, the person is observing you, the, the teacher, spiritual master is observing you, and he can even see how you react. And he can also say the same thing in a different way so you can get it clearer. Yeah. That's true. Yeah, the essence, the whole, the word, Isha Upanishad, not Isha, but Upanishad, comes Upanishad. Upanishad means to sit down near. So the Upanishads, which are the heart of the Vedas, have been transmitted from guru to disciple. Because his disciple is sitting down near and hearing. And that becomes solid Vedic knowledge. Yeah. So 
So that's the, the best way to assume that is on the person. But the books are there when we can't directly hear from the person, but we can get it directly from the book according to our level of receptivity. Yeah. Okay, what time is it now? Twelve thirty. Twelve thirteen? Thirty. Just in time. Okay, we'll take a break for fifteen minutes. You can break your fast. Chant your Gayatri. Remember what I wrote on the conference about Gayatri last night. Hope you're ready. So take a fifteen minutes. We'll come back at twelve thirty-five. We'll give you twenty minutes. And then we'll continue with our explanations. Everyone can stay here.